Now so far we have looked at the variable elimination algorithm and we know that it's query sensitive. This means that we have to rerun the entire algorithm for each query node. And the complexity of the variable elimination algorithm depends on the choice of the uh, elimination click that is in the general graph. We now look at the junction tree algorithm that allows us to generalize the variable elimination algorithm to avoid this. So the main idea behind uh, junction tree is that uh, for any given probability distribution that corresponds to a loopy undirected graph, we can re-parameterize it as a tree, which we call the junction tree. And therefore, we can run the sum product algorithm on this tree uh, parameterization to avoid recomputing or rerun the variable elimination on every single query node. Now, before we define the junction tree, uh, we have to first define the cluster graphs. And a cluster graph is actually an undirected graph such that the nodes or the random variables are in the clusters. So suppose that this is the, my uh, cluster graph. And what it means here is that each one of this uh, cluster, which I call CI over here, it consists of a subset of the random variable xi to xn that is in my joint probability uh, distribution. And the edge between uh, uh, two clusters, which I denote as ci and cj uh, respectively, is associated with what we call the subset. And this subset, which we denote as sij, it is equals to the intersection of ci and cj. This means that uh, it contains the random variables that overlaps between the cluster of i and cluster of j in the cluster graph. And we also further define the family preservation uh, principle over here. So this states that for a given set of potentials, uh, psi 1 all the way to psi uh, k, which we obtain from an undirected graphical model, we can only assign each one of these potential to a unique uh, cluster once and uh, subjected to that the scope of the psi k must be in the subset of the cluster. So what this means is that uh, the random variable that is contained in this factor, in this potential k over here, uh, it must be in the cluster of uh, c alpha k. And hence, the cluster potential is now defined as the uh, as phi i c i equals to all the product terms of all the potentials uh, from the undirected graphical model that we assign to the cluster of i. So notice here that the scope of the uh, potential k over here, which refers to the random variable that is in the potential function of k, must be contained in the cluster of c i in the cluster graph. Now here's an example of a cluster graph uh, that we convert from the undirected graphical model. Suppose that we have this uh, four random variable undirected graphical model that contains x1, x2, x3 and x4 and we only consider the pairwise potentials given by these four terms over here. So the conversion to this would be uh, into a cluster graph. An example of it would be given by this example over here where we can see that uh, we have four clusters in this cluster graph where each one of these cluster uh, contains the, uh, a subset of the random variable from the undirected graphical model. And uh, here uh, we can see that we assign the potential from the undirected graphical model to the respective uh, cluster in the cluster graph where the scope of the potential referring to the random variable that con is contained within the potential must be in the subset of the cluster uh, or in the cluster graph. So for example, in this case here, we see that the this is a valid cluster where we have x1 and x2 and we assign uh, phi 1, 2, which contains x1 and x2 in as a potential to this particular cluster in the cluster graph. And uh, we can see uh, similarly for all this uh, other uh, cluster, the potentials that we assign to it are uh, respectively 
found as a subset in the cluster in the respective cluster in the cluster in the cluster graph and here we can see that uh, each one of the potential from the undirected graphical model can only be used once uh, that means that each one of these potential over here can only be assigned once into the uh, cluster of the cluster graph and the subset defined by the intersection of the random variables between two adjacent cluster in the cluster graph can be seen in this example here uh, the subset of uh, s14 this means that the cluster 1 and cluster 4 would be simply x1 which is the intersection of the random variables that are found within these two clusters as well as another example here would be for example s23 where we look at the intersection of the random variables between 2 and 3 cluster 2 and 3 you can see that only x3 is the in intersection between these two and uh, we uh, leave the other examples to you to figure out so now we'll look at the running intersection property which is an important property for us to get the junction tree from a cluster graph and here the running intersection property uh, states that for each pair of cluster which we denote as ci and cj respectively and a random variable x in the uh, intersection of ci and cj there exists a unique path between ci and cj for which all clusters and subset contains this random variable this set of random variable uh, ci and cj what this means is that suppose that uh, this is an example of a my cluster graph and here if i denote this as ci and this as cj uh, suppose that ci contains uh, x1 x2 and x3 and cj contains x1 and x4 for example and there is an overlap of uh, x1 that are found in both ci and cj so what this means is that uh, the unique path there must exist a unique path between ci and cj and this refers to this path over here where all the clusters that are in the path from ci and cj must contain x1 and if this is the case for all pairs of ci and cj in my cluster graph then uh, this would fulfill the running intersection uh, property and equivalently for any x uh, or any random variable the set of clusters and subsets containing x forms a tree and a valid cluster graph is defined to be one that must fulfill the running intersection property so here's an example of a legal cluster graph where i have the random variable of a b c d and e that forms these uh, five clusters over here and uh, we can see that uh, there's a, the trees are formed by the respective uh, random variable b c d and e as well as a since a here is a it's a just one random variable in one class it actually fulfills the running intersection property and we can see here and another example would be b where it actually forms uh, uh, the paths that is uh, chained out uh, all the clusters that uh, and subset that contains B forms a tree over here and this also fulfills the running intersection property and we can see this is true for all the other random variables that are found in the uh, cluster graph here's an example of a illegal cluster graph where we can see that the random variable B uh, it doesn't form a tree because there is a disjoint cluster over here that is not joined to the main uh, graph over here Here's another illegal cluster graph where we can see that the random variable of B forms a loop in the cluster graph over here and this violates the running intersection property hence this is not a valid cluster graph. Here's another example of a legal uh, cluster graph where we can see that uh, for example the random variable B it uh, forms a tree for example in this case here it's actually a chain uh, linear chain here where uh, it's actually also a valid uh, tree so I'll leave it to you to verify that uh, the running intersection property is fulfilled for all the other random variable in this legal cluster graph so a cluster graph without any cycle is known as a cluster tree 
and a cluster tree that fulfills the running intersection property is called a click tree or otherwise known as the junction tree. So from now on, we'll refer to a cluster in a click tree as click and cluster potential as click potential or we will use it actually interchangeably. So we'll first look at how to compute all the marginals via the junction tree before we look at how to convert a directed or undirected graphical model into a junction tree. Now, uh, suppose that we are already given a junction tree, uh, we will first randomly choose a root click followed by the message passing uh, algorithm where we will look at two types of messages, the inward messages and the outward messages towards the root click from the leaf clicks and from the root click towards the leaf clicks respectively. We'll see that the uh, junction tree algorithm or the sum product algorithm on the junction tree uh, has to also fulfill the message passing protocol. This means that uh, when the message is passed from a click uh, of CI uh, towards CJ, this message will be ready for passing when CI has received all the other messages from all the other clicks that is passing message towards uh, CI. And we'll use the sum of product algorithm to compute the message from CI to CJ. So here, uh, this is the same thing where uh, if we were to look at from CI to CJ, then this simply means that we are going to marginalize away the all the random variables within CI. So in comparison to the sum product algorithm that we saw on an undirected graphical model or a factor graph where we need to simply marginalize away uh, the random variable, one random variable in this node over here, uh, which in the case could be XI, uh, in the factor graph and the undirected graphical model or the directed graphical model. But in this case here, since CI is actually a set of random variables, so what this means here is that we have to marginalize away all the random variables that are contained in CI, except for those that are those random variables that are in the subset of SI and J. The reason is because uh, it's simple over here. The reason is because the set of random variables that are contained in SIJ are also uh, found in CJ over here. So hence, when we pass the message upward from CI towards CJ, we just want to marginalize away the set of random variables contained in CI that are not found in CJ. Hence, this uh, uh, marginalization over CI except for all the other random variables that are found in SIJ. And we'll do this over the product term of all the messages that are coming towards the cluster or the click of uh, CI and multiply by the potential that is uh, from the this particular click itself denoted by phi of i. And uh, finally, the unnormalized marginal probability of the click uh, CI is given by the product of all the messages coming towards the final click over here and the potential of this particular cluster over here. So what's interesting here is that unlike the marginal probability that we can compute using the sum product algorithm in the undirected graphical model or uh, factor graph, uh, this not unnormalized probability is not just over a single random variable. It's actually over a set of uh, random variable. So what this means is that this unnormalized probability distribution is actually a joint probability distribution of all the nodes of all the random variables that are contained in the set of uh, CIJ. So this CIJ contains all these random variables over here. Here's an example to illustrate uh, the every step of the sum product algorithm on the junction tree. And uh, suppose that we are given this particular junction tree over here we can see that uh, the first step to the message passing would be to pass all the messages from the leaf nodes inwards towards the root node where we choose C3, this, this click of C3 over here to be our root node. Then we'll start by passing message of delta 1, 2, delta uh, 6, 3 and delta 5, 4 over here. So following this message passing algorithm that we have defined earlier on that uh, from any uh, click of 
i to click of j we would have to marginalize away all the random variables that is contained within the click of i and not within the subset of sij um, we have to marginalize this over the potential of the click i as well as the multiplication to all the messages that is coming into the cluster of i so in this case here we can see one example here would be delta 1 2 this would be a marginalization over the cluster of c1 except for the random variable contained in the subset of s12 and multiplied by the potential of the click of c1 and we can see that in this case here c1 is equals to x1 so c1 uh, c1 over here is equals to x1 and s12 over here is also equals to x1 so this means that uh, in this case here we do not need to do any marginalization at all and this would be over the potential of uh, the click c1 given by phi1 over here and simply uh, the result of this would be equals to phi1 uh, and let's look at another example here where we pass a message from uh, the click of c6 towards c3 over here so in this case we have to marginalize uh, in this case here c6 will contain x2 and x4 as we can see from the junction tree and the subset of s36 which links c6 and c3 is given by x2 only and what this means is that we have to marginalize away c6 except for all the random variable in uh, s3 and 6 which is x2 over here so this means that simply we have to marginalize over x4 in this case here and uh, here we have to marginalize over the potential of c6 which is given by phi 6 over here so as a result we'll get this term over here and uh, you should verify that all the other messages that i've written here are correct so once we are done with passing all the messages upward towards the root node the next thing that we need to do would be to compute the downward uh, messages from the root node towards the uh, leaf nodes and in this case here the messages would be defined in the same way as before and uh, here we can see that uh, what's important to note here would be we can only start to do this downward passing when all the messages coming into c3 over here are received following the message passing protocol so now let's look at an example of the downward pass for example this uh, delta 3 to 2 this means that i'm passing a message from c3 towards c2 which is uh, this case over here and uh, in this case we'll still follow the message uh, definition as given by this equation over here uh, and where c3 we can see that is actually equals to x1 x2 and x3 and s23 is x1 and x2 so we'll find the uh, non-overlap of these two terms over here which is essentially x3 over here so what this means is that we have to marginalize over x3 so this term over here would be x3 and uh, we have to marginalize over the message that is passed from towards uh, c3 except for the message that is passed from c2 towards c3 so this would be delta 6 3 as well as delta 4 3 over here these two terms we have to multiply so this would be this term over here and then uh, finally we will multiply all these two terms with uh, phi 3 which is the click potential of c3 itself and we'll marginalize this over x5 so uh, it's important here that to note that this is since this is a downward pass from the root node we have to take the two messages in the upward pass towards the root node into account over here i'll leave it to you to verify that all the other messages uh, in the downward pass over here are correct now after we have computed all the messages uh, in the junction tree we can start to compute the unnormalized marginal probability given by this equation over here now suppose that i'm interested in finding the unnormalized marginal probability of c1 what this means is that I would have to take the product of all the messages coming into C1 with the click potential of C1 which is given by this term over here and uh, we can see that this is simply 
equals to phi 1 multiplied by delta 2 to 1. And if we were to substitute the message that we have computed earlier in these steps over here uh, of delta 2 to 1, we can see that uh, this simply evaluate to this particular term over here. And what's interesting over here is that uh, this guy over here, because we are computing the marginal, the unnormalized marginal probability over x1 over here. So this would require us to marginalize over x2 all the way to x6, except for x1 itself, on the joint probability distribution. So we can see that uh, here in deep, we are actually doing the same thing, where we are marginalizing over x2, x3, x4, x5, and x6 over the total uh, click potentials, which we will see later that this total click potential is equivalent to the joint probability distribution of our all the random variables. Now here let's look at another example of the unnormalized click potential of C2. Uh, in this case over here, we will follow the definition to compute the unnormalized marginal probability, where we will simply take the product of all the messages coming into C2, which is uh, delta 1, 2, as well as delta 3, 2 over here, these two terms, multiplied by the click potential of C2, represented as phi of 2 over here. And what's interesting over here is that uh, the unnormalized probability over the click of C2 is given by the joint distribution of x1 and x2, the two random variables over here. And what this means is that the final thing that we have computed over here would be the joint probability, the unnormalized joint probability distribution of x1 and x2. And in order to compute the marginal probability, the uh, we have to normalize over uh, x1 and x2, the sum over x1 and x2 over here. So uh, this simply means that we have to do two more steps of uh, marginalization over this uh, joint probability distribution of the clique of uh, C2. And in order to compute the marginal probability of x2 or the marginal probability of x1 from this joint probability distribution that we have computed earlier on, we would have to marginalize away the Nielsen random variable. So in the case of the probability of x2, we have to marginalize over x1. And in the case of the probability or over x1, we have to marginalize over x2 on this joint probability uh, distribution over here. And here we can see that uh, this is a smaller marginalization over a smaller joint uh, distribution compared to the naive way of uh, e eliminating or variable elimination over all the random variables. Now I'll leave it to you to look through this unnormalized uh, probability distribution over all the other clicks in the junction tree given by this particular example. So after looking at the sum product algorithm on a junction tree, we'll now look at how to construct a junction tree from an undirected graphical model or a directed graphical model. So the first step here would be to do a triangulation, which means that we are getting a reconstituted graph from the undirected graphical model. Now suppose that if we are given a directed graph, we, we have seen in the earlier lecture that uh, the first step to do to get to do a triangulation or to get the reconstituted graph would be to moralize this directed graph into undirected graph. This means that we would have to uh, drop all the edges of the directed graph and marry all the parents of every single node in the graphical model. And uh, the next thing to do would be to choose an elimination order. Uh, suppose that in this uh, directed graphical model, we choose an elimination order of 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And after the moralization, which we have uh, dropped all the edges of the directed graphical model, as well as doing moralization, which we marry all the parents of each one of the random variable. In this case here, uh, only x6 has a pair of uh, random variable as its parents node. So we will marry these two parents over here uh, by putting an edge between x2 and x5 over here. And the next thing is that we will follow this elimination order to do the el random, uh, elim random variable elimination on from this uh, moral graph over here. 
and here we choose 654321 uh, and we'll follow this order to eliminate the random variables where we'll add the additional edges formed by the elimination process into the graph and this gives us the reconstituted graph as shown here. Now the next step would be to get all the clusters and all the possible subsets. We'll use the elimination click as the cluster and a possible subset would be the intersection between any two clusters. So in this example here, we see that uh, following the elimination order of 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, we get the elimination click of x6, x2 and x5 over here. So we'll form it into a cluster which we call C5 in this case. Then we'll eliminate x6 and uh, followed by looking at x5 over here. So once we uh, eliminate x5, we can see that during the elimination, we will form an elimination click of x2, x3 and x5 over here. So we will use this elimination click as another cluster. And now we eliminate x5 and we'll look at uh, x4 over here. So here x4, the elimination click is just simply x2 and x4 over here. So we will use this as another cluster and we will eliminate x4. Then followed by looking at x3 where we can see that the elimination click over here would be x1, x2 and x3. So we will use this as another cluster and then we will eliminate x3. And finally we are left with an elimination click of x2 and x1 which we will use as a cluster over here and we will eliminate x2. Then now we are left with x1 which we will use as the last cluster C1 here. And now after getting the all the possible clusters C1 all the way to C6, we'll form a graph uh, by assigning the clusters as the nodes, the six nodes in the graph over here. And we'll get all the possible subset which uh, is obtained by the intersection of every single pair of uh, intersection between CI and CJ where CI and CJ are two, any two nodes uh, in this particular graph over here. So we'll exhaustively write down all the possible subset that contains any intersection between any pair or the pairs of the uh, cluster in this graph over here. And this would be a resulting graph of the uh, undirected graphical model that we have seen earlier on. So previously we have looked at how to assign the random variables into the clusters. Now we'll look at how to assign the, each cluster with the potentials from the undirected or directed graphical model. Now suppose that we are given this uh, directed graphical model with this uh, joint probability distribution over here or otherwise the, it can also be rewritten into an undirected graphical model of the, that consists of the potential distributions over here. So one important rule that we must follow when we are assigning cluster potentials is that each one of the conditional probability or potential can only be used once when we assign it into the uh, cluster potential. So in this case, we have six clusters uh, in the graph and each one of the cluster consists of a, a subset of random variables as shown here. So here we must make sure that the scope of each one of these uh, factors that we, are, that we use to assign the uh, cluster potentials must be in the uh, cluster. This means that uh, the random variables that are found in each one of the these potentials over here or the conditional probability over here, it must be a subset of all the random variables in the respective cluster that we assigned it to. Now here is an example over here where we can see that this uh, marginal probability contains only the random variable of x1. Hence it can be assigned, it can actually be assigned to this cluster phi1 or this cluster of phi3 over here uh, because and also this cluster of uh, phi2 over here because all these three clusters consist of uh, the random variable of x1 in it. Uh, but one thing to note is that one important thing to as stated here to note is that this particular conditional probability or potential over here can only be assigned once into the cluster potential. So in this case, we assigned it to already to uh, phi1 over here. We cannot use the same probability over here. 
to assign it to five two or five three. Now the next thing to do would be to get the click tree or the junction tree, and this is equivalent to finding the maximum spanning tree on the graph that we have formed earlier uh, over the cardinality of the subset. This means that we are using the cardinality of the subset as the weight of every respective edge in this graph over here. So you can see that, for example, in this case here, the subset contains only x1, hence the weight would be only 1. And in this case here, the subset contains x2 and x1. So this means that the weight of the edge is 2 over here. And we will find a maximum spanning tree from this uh, graph over here. And now we will see that uh, cluster tree is a junction tree or a click tree only if it is a maximal spanning tree. Here's the proof of it. Now consider a random variable of xk and a cluster tree t with cluster uh, ci and subset sj. The fact that the tree that t is a tree implies that uh, on this side over here we are looking at uh, the cardinality of xk or the count that xk uh, appears in the subset of sj over the in the in the particular uh, graph or the cluster tree over here so we are going to sum this over all the possible m minus 1 edges in the tree now uh, this is equivalent to suppose that i'm given a tree that looks something like this for example and what i'm interested in is that i'm going to sum over all the edges over here that means that i'm going to sum over all the subset over here uh, and uh, which i denote as by the index of j so this is sj over here where i'm going to count the time that uh, or the occurrence that xk appear in all this subset over here hence there's an indicator function over here which is equals to one when xk appears in the subset of sj and i'm going to do this over all the edges over all the subset in the cluster tree over here and we note that this must be lesser or equals to the number of count that xk appear in the cluster of ci so in a tree there are m minus one edges when there's m number of uh, nodes over here so what this means is that i'm going to sum over all the occurrence of xk in all the cluster within this particular tree over here and the maximum number of xk occurrence of xk in all the subset in this cluster tree must be upper bound by the total number of times that xk appears in all the clusters minus one this is because uh, minus one because the edges is equals to the number of nodes minus one which is the same case over here hence this must be uh, upper bound and we can see from this particular inequality equation here that it becomes a equality sign this means that this guy over here must becomes equal when xk forms a subtree this means that it fulfills the running intersection property of this m node graph over here which means that when this is an equal sign this means that xk must appear everywhere in the subset as well as the cluster over here now we can see that the inequality equation that we have seen earlier in the previous slide that is defined over a subgraph of m nodes can be generalized to the overall graph that consists of n number of nodes in this uh, inequality equation where we simply sum over all the n nodes in the graph and in this case here we can see on the left side of the equation that this is simply equals to the total cardinality of all the subset in the graph uh, where we can, in the first step here we can see that uh, the summation over n and the summation over m minus 1 can be sorted over here so since this is a summation over all the nodes in the graph we can see that uh, this guy over here this whole term over here is simply equivalent to the total cardinality of the subset in the graph and in this case over here uh, we can also see that we can push this summation of n into the one over here which is simply n and we can sort the order of this and here this guy over here 
would be simply equals to the total cardinality of the clicks in the graph. And we can rewrite this total cardinality of the subset in the graph as the total weight of the graph. This means that we are counting the total weights of the uh, in all the edges of the uh, final tree that we have uh, obtained. And we saw from the previous slide that for the running intersection property to hold, this inequality sign has to become an equality. What this means is that uh, since the total cardinality or the, or the weight of the tree is upper bounded by uh, this term over here, uh, this means that in order for it to uh, be a running intersection property, it has to take the maximum uh, possible value uh, which is given by this equality sign here since this is lesser or equals to and hence this means that in order for the running intersection property to hold the weight of the tree that we obtain must be a maximal spanning tree which is equivalent to the maximal weight of the tree uh, possible and given a graph with all the edges that is equivalent to the cardinality of the subset we can find a uh, maximal spanning tree by running the Kruska algorithm or the PRISM algorithm. So here's an example of the uh, pseudocode of the Kruska algorithm and it's actually a greedy approach where we simply uh, select any nodes and then we expand out uh, by selecting so in this case here this node over here it might have multiple edges and what we are doing here would be to select the one for every node that in that we are looking at we will select the one that has the maximal edge uh, weight. So we'll do this progressively uh, by searching for the maximal weight of every single node in the graph until we exhaust all the nodes in the graph. Here's an example of the uh, maximal uh, spanning tree that is obtained from the graph that we have seen earlier in the previous slides. And uh, it's important to note that uh, in this case here, the maximum cardinality is uh, altogether 6 plus uh, 1 plus 1 which is 8 over here and we can see that this is not the only maximum spanning tree that we can obtain from the graph as uh, that we saw, saw earlier here's another example where the total cardinality is equals to 6 plus 1 plus 1 which is 8 and we can see that this is also a valid uh, junction tree uh, with a, which is also a maximal spanning tree uh, with the same uh, total amount of weight as compared to uh, the previous example as shown here. So in summary, we have looked at how to represent the joint distribution with a vector graph and use it to compute the marginal and conditional probability distribution. We have also seen that a vector graph is uh, one that allows us to uh, represent uniquely the factorization of a joint distribution but it's not one that allows us to uh, encode conditional probability because in contrast to the undirected and the directed graphical model there's no notion of this separation as well as the Markov property in vector graphs. We have also seen how to use the max product algorithm to find the maximal probability and its configuration. Finally, we saw how to convert a directed graphical model and an undirected graphical model into a junction tree and use it to compute the marginal uh, and conditional probabilities of a joint distribution.